All right, this is Mrs. Ignacio, PNR 104, Chapter 17, Infection Prevention and Control in the Hospital and the Home. So again, these are the objectives, things that we should know after our discussion and after you do your readings. Remember, look at the bold words, those key words, and look at the objectives in the front of the chapter and look at the key points, the summary at the end of the chapter as well. Make sure you peek at those tables because those tables, excuse me, have a lot of great information. We're going to talk about the stages of infection. We're going to list common healthcare associated infection, also known as nosocomial infection. We're going to talk about transmission-based precautions that we use with standard precautions. And these are the precautions that we treat every patient like they have something that we don't want to take home with us to our families. Compare and contrast airborne precautions with droplet precautions. And we're gonna discuss, <coughs> excuse me, special requirements for airborne precautions when a patient has pulmonary tuberculosis. And I feel like <laughs> I need to be on precautions right now. Okay, we're also gonna look at, <coughs> excuse me, infection prevention and control, uh, how we handle specimens, disposing of soiled linens, trash, sharps, and how we clean in the isolation setting, our equipment. Uh, and we're going to talk about how the nurse can provide psychosocial care, right? And that is mental health care, <laughs> excuse me, for the patient that is in isolation. And we're going to talk about the rules for surgical asepsis. <laughs> excuse me, in a clinical setting or a lab setting, when you're working with Mrs. Holland or when you get ready for clinicals, you're going to understand how to use standard precautions, transmission-based precautions, how to properly bag and remove soiled linens and any materials that have bodily fluids on them. And you're going to teach your patients how to dispose of them at home and teach your patient how to perform <coughs> proper hand hygiene. All right, let's jump right in with infection and let's talk about the stages of infection. <coughs> so first is the incubation period. And so this is when this pathogen, this disease causing organism, it could be bacteria, virus, protozoa, helminth, rickett, rickettacea, uh, protozoan um, virus. So any one of those pathogens, this organism, this microorganism enters the body and it then, <clears throat> and then it lasts until the onset of symptoms. What are symptoms? Well, I don't feel well. Uh, I might have a fever. I just may have aches and body pains. And this is a time when a patient is infectious and can pass their infection on to another person, another patient, a healthcare provider. <laughs> the prodromal period is the short time from the onset of vague symptoms, just maybe a little bit of malaise. And I do think that is uh a question that you will see just general kind of, um, you know, not feeling well, right? That's the prodromal period. Okay, and so it's a short time of onset of vague symptoms to specific symptoms. And this, uh, during this stage, the patient is highly infectious. So that's a short time. So there's the incubation when the organism first enters. Okay, and then when we the patient starts feeling those symptoms, that uh, those vague symptoms, it could be just they don't feel well. <clears throat> that's the prodromal period. And this is a highly infectious time. Okay, and so we may have noticed that with COVID, people, they had seemed to be fine. And then the next day, they start getting those symptoms and they realize that, hey, they were at a super spreader event and they ended up uh, testing positive, right, uh, later on. Okay, now the illness period, this is when localized and systemic symptoms appear. And when we say systemic, we think about the body's 11 systems. So they may have respiratory systems, gastrointestinal intestinal systems. And when I say respiratory, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, gastrointestinal symptoms, they may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. 
Okay, so in the illness period, the patient can have fever, headache, malaise. Malaise is a feeling of being unwell. They just don't feel good. And then uh, there could be, <laughs> excuse me, disease-specific symptoms. So we're thinking leukocytosis, uh, which is increase in white blood cells, rash, swelling, or edema, wound drainage also is a sign of infection, diarrhea, vomiting. So the severity of this illness period depends on the virulence, how strong, how, um, you know, um, how strong or how much of the disease is or of that pathogen is able to replicate inside of the patient and how is the patient's immune system okay that's going to depend on how severe this infection is and we've seen that with covid that some people were infected it was a short time and they bounce back. Some people were hospitalized for months. Some people did not survive. Okay. Now this convalescent period that begins uh, when the symptoms are subsiding and continues until the person returns to their normal status, their previous level of functioning. Okay. Now let's jump into hospital acquired, <laughs> excuse me, health care associated infections. Again, another name for these can be um, nosocomial infections, an infection that the patient picks up in the hospital setting. So this is not good if a patient gets this kind of hospital or healthcare associated infection on our watch. Okay, so you must be thinking, well, how can I prevent that from happening? Okay, to my patient, how could I prevent myself from getting a hospital or healthcare associated infection? Okay, well, let's talk about who is at the greatest risk. Well, patients that have surgical incisions, if they have drains, like a, a Penrose drain or a JP or Jackson Pratt drain, if they have a chest tube, right? Those patients um, are at great risk because those drains can actually harbor uh, bacteria and it's a place for bacteria to replicate or those pathogens to replicate. Patients that have artificial airways are at great risk. Uh, patients that are intubated, tracheostomy, they're at great risk. Patients that have urinary catheters are at great risk. And remember, if the patient has a urinary catheter, we must perform perineal care. We must wash their genitalia, okay? And we must also wash and dry uh, the, not only the genitalia, but the catheter tubing as well. Patients that have IV lines, intravenous lines, they're at great risk because anytime we break the skin, right, that is a potential opening for a pathogen to get in. Patients that have implanted prosthetic devices are at risk. So that could be your patient that has an artificial knee, artificial hip, a patient that has a pacemaker, Right. These are all devices that are implanted, surgically implanted into the patient. Patients that have to keep getting injections or venipunctures, many blood draws, and patients that are immune compromised. So these are just a list of those that patients that are at greatest risk for a healthcare associated infection. So what are we going to do to prevent our patients from getting a healthcare associated infection? Well, we want to use medical and surgical asepsis. We want to make sure that our environment is as clean as possible. We're gonna use standard precautions and that is uh, for everyone, for all of our patients. That means we're going to uh, treat every patient as if they have something that we don't want to take home. Whenever we think we're gonna come in contact with bodily fluids, mucous membranes or any bodily discharge, we will wear gloves. And then there's also transmission-based uh, precautions. And so that's going to be really particular based on the condition that the patient has, okay? So the other thing that we need to do for our patients is to monitor them, right? And so we're looking at the diagnostic reports, we're looking at lab values, <clears throat> excuse me, we're observing the patients for signs of infection. Uh, that could be fever. That shows us that the patient may have a systemic infection. A localized infection could be redness at the site, warmth, and also edema or swelling. We're going to also um, implement procedures um, 
to contain the microorganisms. And so that could range from hand washing, disinfecting, sanitizing, sterilization, disposing of contaminated items. These are all things that we're going to do to keep the patient's uh, risk of getting a healthcare associated infection at a minimum. We're also going to look and recognize individuals that are at high risk. Okay, so let's look at our current standards. When we think about standards, we have different tiers. Tier one is standard precautions. So we're not going to come in direct contact with bodily secretions. Okay, so we will wear gloves if we think we're gonna come in contact with the patient's mucous membranes, bodily fluids, urine, feces, blood, uh, breast milk, all of those things, okay? All of those kinds of secretions. Tier two, we are talking about transmissions-based precautions. So we're gonna break that chain or that cycle of infection by identifying specific secretions that might be infective. So if my patient has a wound on his leg that has MRSA, I'm going to implement contact precautions, specifically contact with that wound. And so I will be very careful of how I dispose of those old dressings. Um, any old bandages for that wound because I know they can be potentially infective, okay? Transmission-based precaution uh, should always be used with standard precaution. Again, standard precaution is gonna be used for every single patient, okay? So standard precautions used for every single patient. Airborne precautions, whatever this pathogen is, this causative agent, this microorganism that causes illness, it lingers in the air. Examples of that is going to be your measles, your varicella, your chicken pox, right? Your tuberculosis. And for tuberculosis, it says special mask. That means that nurses need to have an N95 mask. COVID, the nurses need to have an N95 mask to protect them from these pathogens that linger in the air a lot of times, even for hours at a time. So if your patient has TB, they're in an elevator and they cough, two hours later, that tuberculosis bacteria can still be in the air. So that's why your TB patients, they must be placed in a negative pressurized room. So the air is not circulating. The air that's in that room with that tuberculosis patient is not circulating with the rest of the facility. It goes outside of the building. Okay, if the TB patient has to come out of the room, they must wear a mask. Teach this patient to cough inside of their elbow and to cover their mouth if they're coughing. Okay, wear a mask. Droplet precaution is another transmission-based precaution. And this is, again, these are all highly contagious kind of scenarios. Meningitis, if you have a meningitis patient that comes in, one of the first things that you want to do is isolate the patient, right? Because we know that it's highly contagious. It could be bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis. Either way, we want to isolate the patient and <clears throat> put them on droplet precautions. Pneumonia, diphtheria, again, droplet precautions. And the droplet precautions are smaller, but they come out of, you know, the patient coughing, sneezing, even talking, but those droplets are, are I, I should say those droplets are larger, so they fall to the floor. They don't hang out in the air like the smaller droplets, if, like in your measles, varicella, and tuberculosis. Okay, when we think, <clears throat> excuse me, contact precautions, that means direct contact, so we think skin, the GI uh, system, so gastrointestinal system. When I say gastrointestinal system, that's anything from the mouth to the anus, okay? Everything in between. So wound infections can be contact, like the example I use with MRSA, okay? RSV, that is respiratory succinctal virus. Unfortunately, that does attack our pediatric patients, right? They're the, one of the most... Um, really um, vulnerable populations. And the herpes simplex virus is also another kind of contact precaution. So now let's talk about PPE, because now I've told you all the things that you don't want to take home to your family. Let's talk about the PPE. Never touch anything with bare hands, 
<laughs> excuse me, that contains fluids from a body surface or cavity. So we're, we're talking blood, urine, feces, vomitus, right? We always want to wear gloves when we come in contact with any body fluid, okay? So gloves need to be worn, okay? If uh, you're not going to come in contact with skin that's broken or if you if everything is clean, then you don't need to wear gloves. A lot of times you don't know what you're going to find. So I would submit to you, especially as a student, is probably to be on the safe side is to wear gloves. If you're in doubt, ask your instructor, ask your clinical instructor. They will be more than happy to make sure they keep you safe and they guide you in the right direction. All right, let's talk about the application of the nursing process. So I know you all know about ADPI. That's assessment, diagnosis being your nursing diagnosis, planning, intervention or implementation, and your evaluation. So as we assess our patient, we are gathering data. We're looking at the health history and physical. We're looking at the subjective data, what the patient tells us, okay? It burns when I pee. Objective data, that's what we see as healthcare providers x-rays, blood work, uh, physical examination. We are looking, we are assessing for any signs of infection that might require transmission-based precautions. We're looking for wounds. We're looking at the patient's temperature. Okay, we're looking at lab studies that indicate uh, infection. So that's going to be your white blood cells uh, if that's elevated. We're looking at their iron. If a patient's iron is low, that's a sign that they may have, excuse me, chronic infection. Right. So all of those things are things that we should be looking, uh, looking at, again, using our critical thinking. Think about problem statements, right? So if the patient has a potential for infection, because in chapter 16, we talked about those risk factors, age, immune status, if they're an organ donor, if they're a smoker, right? Those are some reasons why a patient could be at risk for infection. <clears throat> so potential for infection, RT means related to, the related to the fact that the patient has a surgical wound. Whenever the skin is broken, that is an opportunity for infection to set in. Whenever there's an invasive procedure, the, we, I'm always concerned about infection and hemorrhage, okay? Of course, hemorrhage is gonna kill the patient fastest, but in this case, we're really discussing uh, infection, right? So that surgical wound is, o or an open wound, or or the patient has a weakened condition or a weakened immune system. Okay, now the next thing that we have to think about when we think about our ADPI, right, is our planning. What are going to be the expected outcomes? We don't want the patient to have a healthcare associated infection. Okay, not on my watch. We're going to keep everything tidy, Mrs. Smith, right? You're not going to be getting infected on my watch. Okay, when we're using transmission-based precautions, we want to prepare ourselves, put on our PPE before we get into the room. And sometimes certain rooms have a little vestibule area that, especially for your tuberculosis patients, before you go into the room, there's an area that you can uh, put your gown on and your all of your PPE before you go into the patient's room. Excuse me. So you want to make sure you plan this very well. Okay. So the implementation portion of our nursing process, we're going to teach the patient, teach the patient and their family. How is this transmitted? What are the precautions that we can use to prevent the spread of this particular infectious uh, agent? and understand what standard precautions are. Explain to your patient, we, we wear gloves with everyone, we wash our hands before and after, you know, working with each patient, and hand hygiene is going to be the most important thing that you can do to prevent infection transmission, okay? When your gloves are soiled, remove them, get new gloves. You'll finish working with that patient, <coughs> wash your hands. Sometimes when you're working with the patient, uh, your gloves get soiled. You may even have to wash your hands depending on, you know, what's going on. Okay. If you're going to do any invasive procedure, make sure you wash your hands beforehand. 
that's going to be important. When we are transporting specimens to the laboratory, when we're collecting specimens, it could be sputum, it could be blood, it could be urine, it could be feces. We always wear gloves. We will collect a specimen in a leak-proof container. We don't want to contaminate the specimen, <laughs> and then we're going to bag it. Um, more, more often than not, it's going to be in a biohazard bag. And uh, certain specimens have to be walked down to the laboratory. They cannot be sent to the pneumatic chute. An example would be a liquid stool sample for C. diff. That is watery stool. We're not going to send that down the pneumatic chute uh, in the hospital because if that explodes or if the bag breaks and leaks, now we have C. diff stool throughout the entire system. They're going to have to shut that system down and decontaminate that system. That's going to be a long, painful process. Not good. So something like that would be walked down hand walk to the lab. And you can delegate that to your unlicensed assisted personnel. Okay. Soy linens, <coughs> You don't want to handle them a lot. Keep them away from your body. Put them immediately into the dirty uh, hamper, the soil linen, and make sure that you, um, when the linens are halfway, you know, you want to start emptying those bags because soil linen bags can be very, very heavy. Okay, um, and yes. Um, LPNs can empty those bags, registered nurses can empty those bags, CNA can empty those bags, but, you know, anybody that works in that facility can empty those bags. I many times have emptied the bags because those soil linens don't smell good, right? And you don't want that uh, foul smell to stay in the patient's room. Okay, trash biohazards, we dispose of these, right, in the appropriate receptacle. Uh, in some cases, a red biohazard bag may be needed. If you have saturated dressings that are saturated with blood and fluid, we want to make sure we dispose of those properly. <coughs> Sharps, we never recap used needles. Never, never, ever recap a dirty needle. Needle. Never stick your hand into a sharps container. Okay. And we want to change out those containers again when they're two thirds full. We don't want them to be overflowing. Okay. So other equipment. If your equipment is visibly soiled, send them out of the unit or put them in the location where they need to be so they can be cleaned and disinfected. Okay. That's going to be important. And for nurses, we got to make sure that we take care of ourselves, not just by hand washing, but by eating a balanced diet, having all of our fruits and vegetables, making sure that we keep our skin intact, uh, making sure <laughs> we get plenty of rest and hydration, make sure that we manage our stress, because if we don't, our immune system can become compromised, okay? And when we think about pa patient placement, we want to uh, pay, place certain patients in a room by themselves. So if a patient has a like condition, like a like, um, you know, kind of infection, yes, they can go together. Uh, but certain patients need to be in a private room, period. It doesn't matter if the other patient has the same condition. This condition is tuberculosis. The tuberculosis must be in a separate room without a roommate, private room that is negatively pressurized. Another patient that must have a private room is your shingles patient. The shingles patient, even if the other patient has shingles, they need to be in a separate room. Here's the reason why. Because there's different stages of shingles. There's a phase of shingles when the patient is highly contagious, and then there's a phase when they're not. So if you have two patients that are in different phases of shingles, that one that is still highly infectious can infect the one that is actually on the road to recovery. So we never put shingles patients with other shingles patients. We keep them separate. And if you have a patient that is on isolation precautions, any of these transmission-based precautions, we only transport them if it's absolutely necessary. And for example, if it's the TB patient, they have to leave because they have to go get a chest x-ray, then the patient needs to wear a mask and we need to make sure that anything that could be uh, potentially infectious is covered up, okay?
So we always want to keep the linens away from others, right, until they're washed. Again, teach the patient and their family proper hand hygiene. We will disinfect using bleach and water solution, 1 to 10, 1%, 1, one part bleach, 10 parts water. Um, wash dishes in scalding hot water. Dishwasher under sanitize is going to be best and let them air dry. Um, if the patient is at home, <clears throat> not only, you know, teaching them about linens, hand washing and using bleach and washing dishes and scalding hot water, but also they can use a hefty, heavy plastic jug, like a, a water jug or a bleach, uh, old bleach container to put their old needles so no one will get stuck because you don't want them to just put them in the trash can so no one will get stuck with those needles. Do you want the patient to be taught to use clean gloves? Let the family be taught to use clean gloves and and to keep the patient's room clean. <clears throat> in a protective environment, a patient that uh, is in protective isolation, that room has its own infect, um, sorry, has its own ventilation system. And so you may be wondering, okay, hold on, Mrs. Ignacio, why would a patient be placed in a protective environment? This is your patient that may be immunocompromised. This could be a patient that is neutropenic. They have a low white blood cell count because of chemotherapy. They could be on immune suppressant medications. But this patient is a patient that we wear masks to prevent us transmitting germs to them because they have pretty much no immune system or a low immune system. So no one that's sick should be going into a patient that is on protective isolation. So we really have to be mindful of that. Small children, they're adorable, but I'm sorry, they are full of germs. Okay, so usually small children are not authorized, but again, we're wearing masks to protect them. Now, these patients that are on, <clears throat> excuse me, protective isolation or transmission-based precautions, they can get, you know, depressed. They can say, wow, not a lot of people are coming to visit me. I don't have a lot of visitors because when visitors come in, they have to <clears throat> get gowned up, put on a mask, gloves, and all of those things, and they may be afraid of becoming infected themselves. So they may not have a lot of visitors. So we have to look out for those patients. We have to look out for signs of boredom. If they're, you know, changing their level of consciousness, are they sleeping excessively? Or do they have signs of anxiety, any hallucinations? Are they even having panic attacks? And we have to look out for all those signs um, as well as depression, um, because we know that depression could possibly lead to suicide. Now let's talk about infection prevention and control for the nurse. Well, OSHA is the one that regulates all of these things that we need to abide by. And OSHA really regulates our control of bloodborne pathogens. You should have completed your clinical clearance. That's one of the things that you have to do uh, is uh, take and understand the course on bloodborne pathogens. So the three main modes or ways occupational exposure to bloodborne blood -borne pathogens can occur from puncture wounds, from contaminated needles or sharp. So that's why we immediately uh, apply the safety on our needles and dispose of them in the sharps container, never recap a dirty needle. The second way that someone uh, in the healthcare profession can uh, get exposed is by skin contact. If we allow bloody body fluids and other potentially infectious materials to enter through damaged or broken skin. And again, once the skin breaks, the first immediate action is to always wash it with soap and water. It could be if little Johnny falls on the playground and skins his knee. <clears throat> or if there's a needle stick, or if a toddler bites another toddler, we always want to wash with soap and water. If soap and water is not available, maybe alcohol swabs, um, hand sanitizer, but something to clean that area where the skin has been compromised because we don't want that um, to be an open area where potentially infectious materials could enter the, the damage or broken skin. The third way in which bloodborne pathogens can contaminate healthcare workers is through mucous membranes. <clears throat> 
allowing infectious materials to enter the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, and mouth. Okay, so that's important. We want to make sure that we, if there is a chance that you can get a splash of bodily fluids, then you want to make sure that you're wearing the appropriate PPE to include a mask, eye shield, uh, face shield. All right, let's talk about surgical asepsis. So there's four rules of surgical asepsis. Number one, we need to know what is sterile. Number two, what is not sterile? Number three, separate sterile from unsterile. Number four, remedy contamination immediately, okay? Because our goal when we are working in a surgical aseptic environment is to keep the area free from microorganisms. In lab, you will learn this with Mrs. Holland or whoever your lab instructor will be. You will learn how to properly don sterile gloves. There is a specific way to put on sterile gloves. You will also learn how to set up your sterile field. You will understand the principles of sterility, meaning when I put out my sheet, that my sterile field is on, one inch on the outer edges of that border is going to be considered unsterile and contaminated. Everything inside of that border is going to be considered my sterile field. If I reach across my sterile field, it is now contaminated. If I turn my back on my sterile field, it is contaminated. If I cough or sneeze on my sterile field, it is contaminated. If I put my hands below my waist, my sterile field is contaminated. So these are the principles of sterility, and you've got to know them, and you've got to abide by them so you can keep your patient safe. Now, in the operating room, there are different jobs. One specific job uh, is a surgical scrub tech. Okay, now surgical scrub technician is one that helps and works uh, to make sure that the doctors and the surgicals are the surgical members of the team are scrubbing in. So what does it mean to surgically scrub? <clears throat> well, surgical scrubbing, you're usually scrubbing you're from your fingertips all the way to your elbows using a brush or you're using your hands to vigorously scrub for the entire time. It's usually three and a half minutes, but this slide says two to four minutes, but it's for a long period of time. You are scrubbing in between your fingers, your nails, you're scrubbing your wrist, your forearms, <laughs> because we want to remove as many microorganisms as possible, uh, of course, without damaging our own skin. Um, but we are using friction, we're using specific <laughs> kinds of soap, and we are scrubbing, we are scrubbing, we are scrubbing. That's going to be really important. A lot of times, if you have to go into the NICU, you will have to scrub in. Um, if you're going in for a surgery, you will have to scrub in. Even if you are going in as a student, you still must scrub in because with us, we each bring our own set of microorganisms and we don't want to introduce that to a patient who will is having an invasive procedure, <laughs> okay? When we open these sterile packages, before we do that, we want to perform hand hygiene. We open our sterile packages away from the body and we drop the things that are inside onto our sterile field. We don't um, reach across the sterile field. We don't touch the things that are inside the sterile packaging because once we touch them, if we don't have on sterile gloves, we are contaminated. And if you are touching the outside of a container, your hands are not sterile, okay? So always face your sterile field and allow six inches between the body and the sterile field, okay? So lastly, we're thinking about evaluation. So remember the nursing process is ADPI. The last part of it is evaluation. We're going to evaluate our patient. Did our patient suffer any infection? <clears throat> 
Okay, we're going to look to see did any other <coughs> uh, individuals become infected, other healthcare workers, um, any other patients. So that's going to be the evaluation piece. So at this time, this ends our discussion of Chapter 17. Thank you for your attention. Have a great day and always think like a nurse.